On a winter day, a tiny speck of dust in the air condenses a water molecule, which then grows into a perfect snowflake before landing on the ground. Meanwhile, a woman is brought to a riverside emergency room in California, where an eerie phenomenon is taking place inside her body. Manila-colored crystals are forming within her blood vessels, a process that is not supposed to occur under normal circumstances. The situation takes a bizarre turn when the first nurse to handle the patient's blood suddenly faints, followed by two more medical personnel, who also become lightheaded and collapse. By the end of the night, the patient dies, and 23 hospital staff members are experiencing symptoms of an unidentified illness. Physicians, police officers, and investigators are all asking the same question. What the hell is going on? On February 9, 1994, at 8.15 p.m., Gloria Ramirez, a 31-year-old woman suffering from late-stage cervical cancer, was brought to the emergency room at Riverside General Hospital in Moreno Valley, California. She was semi-conscious, wearing shorts and a t-shirt, and her responses to questions were brief and sometimes incoherent. Her breathing was shallow and rapid, and her heart was beating too quickly, causing her blood pressure to drop. Despite being very ill, she was awake at the time. Gloria was administered medications by the doctors to induce sedation and to control her tachyarrhythmia. However, Gloria's health rapidly deteriorated and defibrillation was required. It was during this procedure that the medical team started to observe unusual phenomena concerning her condition. Upon removing her shirt, the ER personnel discovered an oily sheen covering Gloria's body. Even stranger, the doctors and nurses could smell a fruity garlic-like scent coming from Gloria Ramirez's mouth. Susan Kane, a skilled RN, took the syringe to draw blood and detected an ammonia-like scent emanating from the tip of the syringe when she withdrew it from the catheter. Kane then passed the syringe to Maureen Welch, a respiratory therapist, before attempting to identify the origin of the unusual smell by getting closer to Ramirez. After receiving the syringe from Kane, Welch also smelled the ammonia-like odor. It was like how rancid blood smells when people take chemotherapy treatment, Welch later said. She then handed the syringe to Julie Gorczynski, a medical resident, who discovered manila-colored particles floating in the blood and confirmed the ammonia odor. Dr. Humberto Ochoa, who was overseeing the ER, also noticed the unusual particles and agreed that the syringe had an ammonia smell. This made it four individuals who detected the strange smell and particles in the blood. After attending to Ramirez, who was still alive at the time, Susan Kane stood up and suddenly felt lightheaded. She headed towards the door but lost consciousness and was caught before hitting her head on the ground. Julie Gorczynski also experienced similar symptoms and had to be placed on a stretcher for her safety. Maureen Welch later exhibited comparable reactions and was promptly removed from the scene. The medical staff began to realize that something was amiss when additional nurses began to feel unwell. To prevent further contamination, they directed all the ER patients to be evacuated to the parking lot and the doors were sealed. Those who had been affected were instructed to remove their clothing, which was then placed into bags. 45 minutes following the incident, Gloria Ramirez was declared dead due to kidney failure that resulted from her stage 4 cervical cancer. Out of the 37 ER personnel present, 23 became sick after being exposed to hazardous fumes emanating from Gloria's body. Several of these medical practitioners were so severely affected that they had to be hospitalized, with one nurse remaining under observation for 10 days due to tremors and apnea. Julie Gorczynski, the resident doctor, was the most critically ill among all the patients. She experienced convulsions and intermittent breathing and was diagnosed with hepatitis, pancreatitis, and avascular necrosis of the bone marrow. 
As a result, she suffered from crippled legs for several months and underwent three surgeries. She remained in the intensive care unit for a period of two weeks. Even after her death, Ramirez remained hazardous and required a specialized hazmat team to move her body. The backup trauma team took extreme precautions and wrapped her body in multiple layers of shrouds, placed it in an aluminium casket and isolated it in a specific section of the morgue. A hazmat team was deployed to search the emergency room for any evidence of the substance that had been released and caused mysterious symptoms in numerous individuals. However, their search yielded no results. It appears that fumes emanating from Gloria's body affected the hospital staff, but it remains unclear what exactly caused the symptoms. A puzzling observation was that despite being in closer proximity to Gloria, none of the ambulance staff experienced any symptoms. Despite one of the most extensive forensic investigations in history, even 28 years after her death, no conclusive explanation for the toxicity that Gloria Ramirez exhibited has been found. However, the cause of her death is known. She had stage 4 cervical cancer, experienced renal failure, and ultimately suffered cardiac arrest. The Ramirez family had no knowledge of any foreign substance that Gloria had consumed or come into contact with that could have caused such a toxic reaction. On top of it, it was later found that she wasn't even going through chemotherapy at that time. Few days later, in downtown Riverside, preparations were underway for one of the most elaborate autopsies ever conducted in US history. No one was sure what pathologists would find when they opened up Gloria Ramirez's body, but they were ready for the worst. Health officials weren't taking any chances when it came to autopsy. With the help of experts from Cal OSHA, the State Worker Protection Agency, elaborate steps were taken to shield the pathologist and his crew from whatever strange chemicals might be lurking in the corpse. Inside the Riverside County Coroner's Office, a special chamber was constructed so the four men dealing with the body would be sealed off from the rest of the world. They would wear level A protective suits, spacesuit-like gear normally used by specialists cleaning up toxic spills. Outside the chamber, four members of Riverside County's hazardous materials team watched the autopsy via a video monitor. They too wore protective suits and were assigned to rescue those inside if problems arose. The scene was like something out of a science fiction movie. And the mood was tense. More than 50 reporters had gathered for the spectacle. During a media briefing in the basement of the coroner's office, a reporter shouted to county officials, What are you afraid of? Chief Deputy Coroner Dan Cupido yelled back, the unknown. They collected samples of various substances, including tissue, blood, and even air from the body bag. However, the results of the analysis revealed nothing abnormal. The coroner's office concluded that there was nothing that would have caused harm to the hospital staff or been inconsistent with a victim of cervical cancer. The coroner tried to close the investigation on Miss Ramirez's death citing the strange smells as simply the residues of a dying person. But when the findings were made public, the Riverside coroner faced intense public scrutiny to identify the harmful substance solely to prevent similar incidents from happening in the future. This led to two further autopsies by the coroner's office, but results were still inconclusive. Riverside Hospital had a history of being involved in fatal incidents. In 1991, two employees were hospitalized after poisonous gas was accidentally released from a sterilizer. Additionally, in 1993, sewer gas was detected in the emergency room. These occurrences led Gloria's family to believe that she died due to the hospital's inadequate conditions Adding to the oddity of the situation, Stephanie Albright, 
who was appointed to investigate Gloria's case from the coroner's office, took her own life one month into the investigation. The coroner's office attributed her suicide to the immense pressure she was under. Adding to the suspicion, the syringe that contained Gloria's blood was inadvertently discarded. In response, Gloria's family took legal action and filed a malpractice and wrongful death lawsuit against Riverside County. They believed that the hospital was attempting to conceal the actual events that led to Gloria's death. After two months, Gloria's family requested an autonomous autopsy, which was conducted by Dr. Richard Fukumoto. However, the body had decomposed significantly and the autopsy failed to provide any definite conclusions. The reason for the extensive decomposition was attributed to the faulty freezers that were used to store the body. Furthermore, Gloria Ramirez's heart was absent, indicating that it might have been removed during the coroner's autopsy. This has led some to speculate that the hospital was attempting to conceal a significant issue. Finally, after a span of two months, Gloria's family decided to have her buried in a local cemetery. However, there were concerns about the potential health risks posed by her body. To address these concerns, the cemetery took special precautions during the burial, including placing her casket in a concrete vault and covering it with a layer of soil mixed with lime. These measures were intended to prevent any potential leakage of toxic substances from the casket into the surrounding environment. Initially, it was hypothesized that Gloria may have taken insecticides or pesticides with the intention of ending her life. These chemicals contain the lethal organophosphate, which is a common ingredient in such products. However, Gloria's family refuted this claim by stating that she would never take her own life and that they do not have any of these chemicals in their home. Another theory that has been proposed is that Gloria Ramirez may have been suffering from a rare condition known as autobrewery syndrome. This condition is characterized by the overgrowth of yeast in the gut, which can ferment carbohydrates and produce alcohol. Researchers have suggested that Gloria Ramirez's symptoms, such as the fruity odor and the unusual appearance of her blood, could be explained by this condition. However, there is little evidence to support this theory. Autobrewery syndrome is extremely rare, and there have been no documented cases of it causing the type of symptoms that Gloria Ramirez experienced. In the beginning, California Department of Health and Human Services was summoned by the County Health Department to investigate the incident. Doctors Anna Maria and Kirsten Waller were assigned to the case, and they conducted interviews with 34 hospital employees who had been working in the emergency department on February 19th. The doctors utilized a standardized questionnaire and discovered that those who had experienced severe symptoms, such as muscle spasms, loss of consciousness and shortness of breath, had certain factors in common. Individuals who had worked in close proximity to Ramirez, specifically those who had handled her intravenous lines, were at a greater risk. However, other factors that were linked to severe symptoms did not correspond with the possibility of fumes being released. Their interviews also indicated that those who had severe symptoms were mainly women and had normal blood test results after exposure. The doctors concluded that the hospital employees experienced a case of mass hysteria. As per their observation, since there was no evidence supporting the presence of a poisonous gas, the only plausible conclusion was that the 23 individuals had fabricated their sickness. The doctors determined that some of the patients had such a vivid imagination that they convinced themselves that they needed intensive care. However, several healthcare workers who were considered to have been imaginary filed a defamation lawsuit against the hospital, the health department, 
and the two investigators responsible for formulating the mass hysteria explanation. According to staff writer Susan Goldsmith at the Los Angeles Weekly, New Times, the hospital where the incident occurred may have been the location of a clandestine laboratory used to unlawfully produce methamphetamine. In two separate issues published on May 15th and September 11th, 1997, Goldsmith reported that chemicals related to methamphetamine could have been smuggled out of the hospital inside IV bags. One of these bags may have been mistakenly connected to Gloria Ramirez. According to the forensic chemist, who was quoted in the article, those smells and symptoms are classic to meth fume exposure. The production of methamphetamine is reportedly a significant industry in Riverside County, where the hospital was situated. Law enforcement had closed down over 1,000 meth labs in the region since 1988, and it is possible that many others remained unnoticed. However, I must say that the plausibility of a clandestine meth lab being operated within a large hospital, especially one that is managed by individuals foolish enough to allow an IV bag containing meth chemicals to end up in the emergency room, seems unlikely. The coroner's office enlisted the assistance of the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory to examine the case. Dr. Patrick Grant, a nuclear chemist and the deputy director of the Forensic Science Center at the lab, analyzed the case. To identify the chemical compounds present in Gloria's system, the lab subjected tissue and blood samples to a mass spectrometer. This analysis revealed the existence of a blend of painkillers and an uncommon chemical substance referred to as dimethyl sulfone, better known as DMSO2. DMSO2 is one oxygen atom away from a similar chemical, dimethyl sulfoxide, commonly called DMSO. DMSO, available as a gel in hardware stores, is a potent degreaser and is used by athletes to rub onto sore muscles. Despite not being particularly useful, Individuals still apply it to their skin to alleviate discomfort from ailments like arthritis. Although DMSO does not pose a lethal risk, it can leave a greasy residue on the skin and emit a scent resembling garlic. Even if Gloria Ramirez had applied DMSO cream or gel to her skin, it would not have caused the peculiar symptoms observed at the hospital. So you will ask, how did DMSO convert into DMSO2? and ended up in her blood. According to this hypothesis, her cervical cancer had caused kidney failure and DMSO would have built up to very high levels in her blood. When the paramedics gave her oxygen in the ambulance, the high oxygen concentration in her blood would have combined with the DMSO to create DMSO2. Livermore researchers created an experiment to replicate the same events. DMSO2 present in blood formed white crystals when it was withdrawn through a syringe and cooled below body temperature. These crystals, when observed through blood plasma, were indistinguishable from the manila-colored crystals that the hospital staff had reported. So what about the symptoms experienced by the medical staff? Well, according to Dr. Grant, if DMSO2 gains two more oxygen atoms, it reacts to produce a hazardous substance called dimethyl sulfate, also known as DMSO4, which is categorized as a war gas. The inhalation of DMSO4 fumes alone can cause harm. When DMSO4 is absorbed by the body, it leads to eventual harm to vital organs, such as the heart, liver, kidneys, in addition to inducing convulsions, coma, paralysis, and potentially even death. Research has shown that if a person is exposed to a minuscule amount of half a gram of DMSO4 for 10 minutes, it can lead to fatal consequences if it is dispersed within a space of one cubic meter. DMSO4 fumes also emit ammonia-like smell, which was observed by the medical staff. But question is, how did DMSO2 found in the blood of Gloria convert into DMSO4? And why did not it affect the staff in the ambulance? Here, 
there are two theories. One theory says that electric shocks administered in the hospital during emergency defibrillation in the presence of oxygen could have then converted some amount of DMSO2 into DMSO4. Others say that some of the DMSO2 molecules had already broken down in her bloodstream and in the hospital, when she was again administered oxygen, it would have combined with free sulfates in her blood to form DMSO4. The Livermore Laboratory released a report stating their findings. However, the suggestion that DMSO2 reacts with excess oxygen in the body to form DMSO4 faced criticism from other scientists. Whether this was the case for Gloria Ramirez cannot be definitively determined, as any suspect compounds, apart from DMSO2, would have either evaporated or decomposed into their natural constituents present in the body, thereby obscuring their presence and evading detection by hazmat teams and coroners. Gloria Ramirez's family maintained that she did not consume DMSO. Additionally, other cancer patients have previously used DMSO and have been administered oxygen under similar circumstances. Also, DMSO4 does not cause symptoms of nausea, which the hospital staff reported. After examining all of the evidence, I must say that we cannot know with absolute certainty, and may never know, what caused the tragic events of that February night in Riverside. Personally, I believe that if we disregard all conspiracy theories, the explanation provided by Livermore Lab is probably the most accurate even though the probability of such a chemical reaction occurring is relatively low. So what do you guys think really happened that day?